We're going to do an introduction now to electric chargers and electric fields. I think that's something that a lot of people really struggle with, so that's why I wanted to show you some tricks. Um, I do love that uh, joke there with Tesla, you know, I was making jewels before his Coulomb, ha ha. Um, so let's start off actually with Coulomb's law. Now Coulomb's law is the force between two charges that our distance are apart. Now this force can be attractive, you know, if you have a, a negative charge and a positive charge, those two charges will uh, be attracted. So this could be the force of attraction between them. It can also be a force of repulsion. For example, let's say they're like charges. So that if they're uh, both negative, then they're going to repel. Or if they're both positive, they're going to repel. So this is really important to keep in mind. This is not just an attractive force, this Coulomb's law. It can also be a repulsive force. It just depends on the nature of the charges. So I'm going to start by just uh, writing you the equation here. So it goes F, most people know it here, equals K Q1 Q2 over R squared. This is what I'm going to uh, say it's like here. There we go. Let's put a little square around it. because This is something you get in your data booklet. So what does it mean? I mean, first of all, it means that F is the electric force. And do you remember the units of force? I hope you do. I'm just going to change the color here. Electric force is measured in newtons. That hasn't changed. Now, K is just a constant. You can actually look it up, so you don't have to worry about that. You just look it up uh, on your data booklet. Uh, then you have Q1. That's one of the charges. Again, that could be positive or negative, but we're looking at the nature of that charge. Uh, so let's put in the units of that charge. Uh, do you remember the units of charge? It's Coulomb. And then charge 2, of course, is also in Coulomb. And R is the distance between the charges. So in this case, here, that'll be in meters. And what it does is it tells you, uh, it characterizes this force, which is, uh, of course, it's proportional to the charges themselves. So the size of the charges, bigger charges, will be a bigger force of attraction or repulsion. But it also tells you about the distance. Do you notice it's a 1 over distance uh, squared? In other words, you could say here that, um, let me just write it down here like this. So we could say, for example, that the force is proportional to 1 over the distance squared. So what that means is as the distance, let's say, uh, doubles, let's just say so these two charges then were, you know, double the distance apart, then two squared is four. So that means the force will actually go down by four. And they love to ask these kind of questions on MBA exams. That's why it's really important. And by the way, you can also say that uh, this K here can also be written here as 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, where epsilon is just the primitivity of a vacuum. You can just look that up. But I, I don't think that's actually that that bad. I think that's that's possible to solve questions with it. So here we go. We have an example. So we have two point charges, and they're located in a, on a straight line. So you can see this is point charge Q1, and this is point, char, uh, point charge Q2. Notice Q1 is plus 20, and these are mc, so that'll be uh, millicoulombs. That'll be 10 to the minus 3 coulombs. And then we have Q2, which is negative 10. You have to think about that. Now we're going to draw a vector to represent the resultant force on a positive particle. I think the key thing here is going to be this positive particle. And it's placed at point A. So what it helps to do then is just split this up into two separate, completely separate problems. So in other words, I try to just like imagine, you know, I just sort of hide one of them and just look at the force between two of them. And after that, then I would, you know, hide the other one and look at the force between the other ones. That's how I like to do it. So let's see if we can figure that out. So we don't have to put in numbers. Do you notice? Even though they gave us these numbers right here, I think what's important is that one is positive, one is negative, and it's important that Q1 is twice as big as Q2. I think that's the key part. So let's see if we can do this. Um, I'll do this maybe in light blue here, and I'll maybe use some arrows. Maybe that'll be nice. So let's just deal with Q1. Let's ignore that Q2 even exists because we're going to add up the two vectors here. So if there's Q1, and remember, it's a positive particle. So A is a positive particle. Oops, I shouldn't have done that. Um, so A is a positive particle. Do you think a positive then will be attracted to or repelled by Q1? I hope you know that like charges repel. So it's going to go away from it. Now, I don't know how big to make it. I'm going to just choose sort of a random length. I'm going to make it going away. Maybe I'll make it like sort of that long. If that makes any sense here. I'm going to sort of draw it like that. So this is the force based, uh, this is the force on A caused by Q1. But we also have another force. Right? We also have another force that's caused by Q2. So let's think about that one. 
it's going to be a uh, well, positive charge is attracted to a negative charge so it's going to go towards it and how strong will it be can you see that they're both roughly the same distance away so the distance hasn't changed but the charge has changed can you see that it's half the value so because of that, if you're trying to draw a rough idea of a vector, I could maybe draw myself a vector that's maybe half as long. So whereas, you know, the other one was maybe this long, I have to make it, you know, I don't know, maybe half as long, maybe something like that. So this is the, these are the two different forces. And do you remember how we actually add up forces? We actually add up vectors by uh, doing exactly this. So watch this. This is what's really cool about this, what I can do here. I can kind of cheat here. I'm going to grab this one right here. Let's say I just put it right here. And let's just say then I grab this one. Remember, this is how you can add vectors head to tail. So I can say, I don't know, maybe the vector will be something like, you know, I'll draw it in a different color. Um, there we go. And I'll draw arrow. So we go from the start to the finish. It'll be something like this. I don't know if that made any sense. So this here's the resultant force here. I'm going to maybe label it here. This will be the resultant force. Let's say the net force. Right, because a net force is when you add up the two vectors. You have one vector, you have another vector, then you, know, you have to add them up. So this is a, a rough idea of what it could look like. It's not perfect. If we had the distances, we could actually figure out the exact length of the vectors here. But we didn't need that. We just had to sort of characterize it. So see, although it might look kind of weird, this really tells you this one really will have a net force this way. That means it really will accelerate in that direction. It'll go flying that way because it's repelled by this one a lot. It's attracted to this one a little bit. So that's why instead of going straight back, it's going to go a little bit that way. Now, another thing we do is we can draw electric fields. Now, when we draw them, it's where, a again, it's arbitrarily defined. It actually doesn't matter. We could have chosen them to be negative. And in fact, if we reversed everything in the universe, you know, nothing actually would change here. So... It's the direction that a positive test charge would go. That's sort of the, the definition of electric field line. So if we're going to draw them, this is sort of based on Michael Faraday's, uh, you know, his, his sort of idea about drawing um, vectors, drawing these, these arrows to characterize what goes on around something. So I imagine these are here are pinned. So there's like four different questions here. Imagine I have a positive charge that's just actually been pinned there. It's, it's stuck there. You can't move. Now my question is, where would a little test charge? What I mean by a test charge, I just imagine I picked up a little positive charge, I just placed it somewhere, and I just sort of look, where will it go? So in this case here, just imagine then, I've got a little test charge, um, and it's sitting in my hand right now, and here it is, and I'm gonna place it right here. Where will a positive go from a positive? Do you see it's gonna be repelled by it, so it's gonna go straight away? And what if I place it right here? Can you see where it'll go? It'll go to the right, and then it'll go to the left, and down. In other words, these will be field lines going radially outward. This is how we define them. So we actually define this right here, this electric field, uh, like this. This is how we, we actually characterize them. What about this one right here? How could I draw this one? It's a little bit sneaky. Now there's two charges. You've got a positive and a negative charge. So what would I do here? Imagine I placed one, I don't know, maybe right here, a positive. Remember, it's always a positive test charge. Positive will be repelled by this positive. It wants to go away, but it's also attracted to this one, so it'll probably go like that. And if it's this way here, it'll want to go away, but then oh, it gets attracted this way, and then this way. And you can keep drawing these arrows, right? You can draw an arbitrary number of them, but they go kind of like this. This is the electric field lines around this, which means if you really had these sort of positive particles, they really would follow this path. They really would go away from this. They really would travel in that direction. How about this one right here, a positive and a positive? It wants to go away from this positive, but also away from that one. Then we're just going to go sort of gonna curve upwards and away because I want to try to get away. These are going to be asymptotic here. Like this. And of course, we're still going to have arrows going away because they always want to go away here. So something like this. And look at this one. Now I have two charged plates. I have a positively charged plate and a negatively charged plate. If I drew just a random point right here, where will it go? To see it'll be repelled by the positive, so it wants to go down, and it's also attracted to the negative. So we can just draw an arbitrary number of these lines here. Don't forget the edge effects here. Don't forget to draw the curvy ones over here. They're going to kind of curve that way. Um, I mean, I guess you could draw, you know, a really big curve on like this. There you go, something like that. That's how we can draw electric field lines. 
Now, it seems really arbitrary, but it turns out the number of field lines compared to another one, that can tell you that you know it's a more positive electric field. So maybe it's a good time then to define what we call electric field strength. This is uh, another equation on your data booklet, and it goes like this. F, uh, no, sorry, not F, E equals F over Q. So in other words, this right here is the electric field strength. So it's defined as the force per unit charge. So that means we can actually define uh, it right here. So it's the force is measured in Newtons, charges in Coulombs. And think about this then. If you want to know electric field strength then, what would it be? It would be Newtons, that's the units of force, divided by charge, which is Coulombs. So it would be in Newtons per Coulomb. I really want to be careful. I should actually draw my vector symbols here. I should draw a vector here and here. If I really want to be careful, let's go back actually. I should probably draw my vector symbol here because force is a vector, right? The direction actually matters. We can also define the electric field strength uh, with parallel plates. So we've got two parallel plates here. If you've got a potential difference across them, okay, uh, well then we can actually define an equation for the electric field strength. Now D will be the distance between these two plates. We've got V is the potential difference across. And so we define the equation as this. It just goes E equals V over D. Now remember that, uh, well, we'll define them here, but this right here is in your data booklet, so you don't have to memorize it. E is the electric field strength, and that has units of, well, let's see, it was force over charge, so that must be Newtons per Coulomb. We've got the potential difference across the plates, that's just going to be measured in volts. And D is the distance between the plates, that's going to be in meters. So let's do an example. Here we have two parallel charged plates and they're separated by distance d so maybe i can start by drawing that let's see here so i've got two plates i guess you don't really have to draw them but i'll draw them i'll attempt to here's one plate uh here's another plate. i'm trying to show some perspective here Ooh. and i have a distance d between them all right now we have a potential v uh potential difference sorry a v across them so this is a potential difference of v volts this would be D in meters, I guess. Now we know that the electric field strength between them is E. So the question is, what would be the electric field strength between the plates if the distance between them is doubled? So basically we're looking at what happens if you make 2D. I think it really helps with something like this uh, is to write this down as a ratio. So what I'm going to do is first start off with, I need an equation for the electric field strength between two plates here. So in this case right here, I could just define it as V over D. So this is what I have in general. What I always like to do is write a second one, like this is my new one. What have I done here? Here I've changed things. I haven't changed my potential difference. That's the same. But the distance is doubled, so that means it's over 2D. And again, a nice generic way to always solve these things is to just write these two things one on top of each other. So put E2 over E. Well, that's going to be, let's see, the equation for E2 is V over 2D. The equation for E is just V over D. I know I'm doing it in painful detail, but that's just because some people like to see all the detailed steps. That way I don't skip any. But if you're going to divide a fraction by a fraction, then you have to multiply by the reciprocal. So in this case here, it'll be D over V. And good news, the Vs will cancel out, the Ds will cancel out. You'll end up with E2 equals, let's see, I have a 1 over 2 here. And I have my E here that I need to then bring up to the side. So it'll become E over 2. And this will be my answer. You see how easy that was? E, Z, huh? And that's because uh, what we were able to do here is just consider uh, the effects then of um, changing the distance. If you're a little bit faster at doing this, you don't need to write down all these steps. A lot of people, you know, once you know that you're changing things, you know that the, the things you're not changing will cancel out. So, you know, when you get a little bit better at it, you don't have to do all these steps. But that's okay. I just wanted to show you every step just so I can do it. So you can say, ah, so doubling the distance between the plates makes the electric field be half. That should actually make sense because it's di it's directly proportional to uh, V and it's inversely proportional to D. So if I made D two times, then this obviously is half. So you could have seen it almost immediately just by looking at it.